Matthews, we are uh, gathering inside this morning. Uh, I know the weather is nice enough as it turns out for us to be outside. Um, all of the equipment and the long cables are currently in the Vicarage Garden. Uh, we're in the middle of uh, celebrating New Wine Summer Festival together as a church. It's been amazing so far. God's really been speaking to us. We've enjoyed worshipping together. Um, we've been joining in from our homes as well as in the Vicarage Garden. And the good news is we're only halfway through. There is still time to come and join in with that. So more on that a little bit later. But that is why we're inside all the other equipment that we need to do uh, to do that is, uh, is currently in my garden. Uh, we're going to begin by worshipping together. Um, it's great to, uh, to have you here with us this morning. Just a reminder of how we're kind of handling the, um, the, the, the current guidance and, and restrictions and so on. We're just asking people to keep your masks on when we're inside. So you are very, very welcome to sing as we worship. Uh, that is the good news. But we are asking us to just uh, keep our masks on for that for the time being, just as we continue to monitor how things are going and how best to keep ourselves and one another safe in our gatherings. So we're going to worship the Lord. If you're comfortably able to stand, would you like to stand with us? And the words will appear on the screen. Father, we thank you that we can meet together in your presence. We thank you that because of all that Jesus has done, we can stand before you. We can meet with you, the living God, because of Jesus' sacrifice. And so we praise and worship you this morning. I cry to you, 
In darkest places I will call Incline your ear to me anew And hear my cry for mercy, Lord Were you to count? Were you to count my sinful ways? How could I come before your throne? Yet full forgiveness meets my gaze. I stand redeemed by grace alone. I will wait for you. to know again that Jesus has made that healing possible through his death and his resurrection. The only place we need to look to this morning. Let's sing that verse again. Now he has come to make a way And God himself has paid the price That all who trust in him today
How beautiful to hear the song of God's people again. Lord, we wait in your presence. We long to meet with you. The one who alone can bring healing. The one who alone brings life and joy. Take a moment to enjoy the presence of God. Lord, be lifted high in this place this morning. We exalt you, we worship you, for you alone are worthy of our praise and adoration. So we come before you with, with joyful thanksgiving for who you are and for all that you have done, for all that you are doing, for all that you will do among us. Lord, be glorified. Be glorified, we pray. Amen. Amen. When you're ready, do please uh, take a seat. And uh, at this point of our um, meeting together, our children and young people are going to go through um, to their groups for this morning. So if you are part of our jam groups, 
now is your moment to, uh, to move, so do start making your way and we're going to pray for you uh, as you do that. They are going to be uh, joining in with the, uh, the session from uh, New Wine United Breaks Out this morning. Um, we, uh, we're doing our own thing, we're carrying on our journey through Exodus uh, here at this end of the building, but we will be showing the morning celebration from New Wine after lunch at the Vicarage. So anyone who wants to join us after lunch will catch up on what's been happening uh, with New Wine a little bit later on. Why don't we just pray for our children and young people and their leaders. Father, we thank you that you have made us to be a family of all ages, all stages of faith, and we pray now your blessing particularly on our children and young people and on their leaders as they gather together. May they know your presence. May they meet with you in a special way this morning. May they come back to us even just at the end of this service, changed and transformed more into the likeness of your Son. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Faithful one whose word is life. Come with saving power to free our praise, inspire our prayer and shape our lives. For the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're going to uh, hear now our gospel reading. You can see what that is on the screen if you're following along. Uh, Joe's going to come and read that uh, for us. And uh, one of the things we do each week to mark the importance and the, the central place that the, the story of Jesus has for us is we stand to hear the word of the gospel. So if you're comfortably able to stand, would you like to do that now? Um, if you would rather remain seated, you are very, very welcome at any stage. Please be comfortable in your time with us. Joe, thank you. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Once the crowd realised that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to life which the Son of Man will give him. On him, God the Father has placed the seal of improvement, approval. Then they asked him, what must we, we do to do the work that God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it's my father who gives the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Do please take your seats. We uh, come uh, into God's presence mindful of the ways that, that actually we stray from God's best for us. And, and as we come to now a short time of of confession, one of the reasons we do this each week is that we, we know how easily we just 
our attention gets distracted from Jesus onto other things. And we heard in, in that gospel reading a moment ago how easily we can look to other things in life to feed and sustain us, rather than Jesus, the true bread from heaven, the bread of life himself. And so let's just pause a moment just to reflect back on the, the past week or so and to just bring before God those moments where we know we've looked to other things to sustain and strengthen us, rather than first and foremost to Jesus. And so let us return to the Lord our God and say to him, Father, we have sinned against heaven and against you. We are not worthy to be called your children. We turn to you again. Have mercy on us. Bring us back to yourself as those who once were dead, but now have life through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Father forgive us through the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of his Spirit for all our days. Amen. And gracious Father, revive your church in our day and make her holy, strong and faithful for your glory's sake, in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We are continuing our journey through the Exodus story this morning. If you want to follow along, we're going to be dipping into various parts of Exodus 32. So I'll kind of read bits as we get to them rather than read the whole thing in one go. So you might want to have Exodus 32 open in front of you, either in a Bible or on your phone. And uh, you can follow along with that. Just by way of recap, uh, we've been in this uh, series looking at the Exodus story, uh, seeing how God's people have been brought out of slavery in Egypt and into this place of freedom, but they then need to figure out what does life look like now that we're free? How do we really live this life? And we've seen how God again and again is merciful to his people and he moves constantly towards his people. But what we also see is that time and time again, his people rebel. Now, just a word on rebellion, because I think there's a danger for us that we almost come to see rebellion as a good thing. If you've watched any of the major movie franchises, you might know what I mean. If you've seen things like Star Wars, or I know The Matrix is quite old now, or The, the Lord of the Rings, all of these kind of big, big stories we have in our culture are essentially about rebelling against some oppressive power or force that is trying to subdue and dominate and dehumanize the people. And so we watch these films and we're kind of rooting for the little man and, and we can almost come to see rebellion as a good thing. But we need to be clear that actually the rebellion we're talking about here is, is not rebellion against some tyrant or some oppressive regime. Our rebellion is against a good God who is merciful and pours out grace upon grace to his people. He offers us life and we so often choose death in rebellion. He offers us freedom and so often we rebel and choose slavery again. We rebel against the one thing that we were made for, against the thing that our hearts crave after. And this is what we're going to read about in Exodus 32. So let me read just the first few verses for us. When the people saw that Moses was long in coming down from the mountain, he's, he's been upon the mountain to kind of meet with the Lord, that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come. Make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, 
fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterwards they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. So this is rebellion against the kindness and compassion of God. And what's happened is that in a moment of stress, that moment where they're thinking, where's Moses? Where, where's he gone? He's been gone for ages. Maybe, maybe it's all over. Maybe we're abandoned again. And in that moment of stress, they freak out and they rebel against the kindness of God. And they run straight back to the things that used to enslave them. One of the plagues, we didn't focus on this one at the time, but one of the plagues that led up to their release from slavery in Egypt was a plague on the livestock of Egypt, where the livestock died of disease. And it was God's way of showing Egypt and Israel that this little golden cow, God, that that Egypt worshipped, had no power and was no God at all. And yet now this God that couldn't save Egypt Israel have run to and said, you brought us out of Egypt. It's ridiculous as we look back with the the hindsight of having the whole story. and, And really it's saying that rebellion against God makes us act like fools. Sin makes us look to things to provide for us what they cannot give. And let's be clear that this isn't just the story for this morning. This is our story. This is you and me, every one of us, even the one at the front wearing the dog collar. Each one of us in different ways, we want the gifts but not the giver. We want God's stuff and God's blessings but we don't always want God. Because if we're honest, we think we know best. We, we think we can get things together and get where we need to be. I, I don't need a babysitter. I don't need somebody telling me what to do. And so, We rebel against God and God's kindness. We fail to acknowledge God for a thousand mercies extended to us. And we build our golden calves and we start saying ridiculous things like the Israelites do here. Now our ridiculous things might sound a little bit different. You know, you're the husband or the wife that delivered me from loneliness. You are the child or the job or the car or the house that gives me value that says to the world, I am something. Behold the promotion that, or the clothes or the holiday that makes me a worthy person. And we ascribe all these divine attributes to things and people that are not God. Now, if that's not enough, let's look at how Aaron responds when he gets busted. Because the Bible does make it clear that, that actually our sin will find us out. We have no secrets from God. At some point, out of his great love for us, God will expose our rebellion against him. So let's look down to verse 21. Still in chapter 32, down at verse 21. He said to Aaron, What did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? Don't be angry, my lord. Aaron answered, you know how prone these people are to evil? They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. So I told them, whoever has any gold jewellery, take it off. Then they gave me the gold and I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. Now, we are supposed to smile or chuckle at that point in the story because that is clearly not what happened. He didn't throw the gold in and suddenly out popped this calf. He made it and he chiseled it with a tool in his hand. He knows what he did. So what's just happened here is Aaron is confronted with his sin, his rebellion, and the first thing he does is he blames someone else. God says to him, what did you do? And he's like, wow, you know these people. You know what they're like. They made me do it. And we have this impulse to convince ourselves that we're right and that we're good. And this impulse is so powerful that it doesn't take much for us to blame another person for our sins. 
It's a common conversation we have with children, isn't it? You know, you, you, you chose to push your brother or your sister off the swing. They didn't make you do that. They might have provoked you, they might have done something to offend you, but they did not make you push them off the swing. You, you chose to do that in a moment of retaliation. And we can smile when it's children figuring things out, but we are just as impetuous in our relationship with God. That God says to us, what, what happened there? And we say, they made me do it. They made me do it. Let's be real a moment. You, you will be sinned against, right? You, you will have already been sinned against. There will, be, there will be people in your life who will cause offence to you. You will be aggrieved by their actions. People are going to sin against you and against me, and especially those who are closest to us. That tends to be the way it goes. That's going to happen. But your response to that sin is all on you. That is not on them at all. When we respond in kind, when we retaliate in kind, when we seek revenge or we hold on to bitterness or we go to gossip or slander or whatever it might be in response to someone else's sin, God is not looking down on that situation saying, yeah, I see what they did there. What choice did you have? Now, God is looking down on that situation saying, you had a choice. I've shown you mercy and mercy and mercy again. Show mercy. We always have a choice. So Aaron tries to blame others. The second thing he tries to do here is to justify his actions. And again, we have this impulse, don't we, to say that we're right, trying to convince ourselves more than others that we're essentially good people. I wonder whether Aaron even knows that he's lying at this point in his conversation with God. You know, I just, I just threw the gold in and out came this calf. What are we supposed to do? You know, that's, that's not how it went. And sometimes for us, that impulse to be right and convince ourselves that we're essentially okay is so powerful that it trumps reality. And despite all sorts of evidence, people swear that's not what happened, this, this is what happened. I, I'm not really to blame because of this thing or that thing. And so again, this is our story. We, we are the ones who love to point the finger in blame. We're the ones who love to justify what we've done. Now, what's God's response to that? Now, I know the score. I know this is 2021, and I know the narrative that I'm supposed to buy into at this point. I'm supposed to say that God's response is, oh, just chill. Just don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. It'll be fine. Just be blessed on the path to self-destruction. But that's not what the Bible says. And I would be cruel and unkind as a pastor and a teacher if I was to buy into that lie and to teach it to us. God's response to our rebellion and uh, against his kindness is wrath. God's response to our rebellion is wrath. Turn back with me to verse 7 of chapter 32 because we skipped over a little conversation that Moses has uh, up on the mountain with God about what, uh, what is happening. Verse 7, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people, whom you brought up out of Egypt, have become corrupt. They've been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They've bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, O Israel. Who brought you up out of Egypt. I've seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. Welcome to St. Matthew's. It's a, a wonderful message and a hard message. Just a few chapters ago, Israel have entered into this covenant with God where God says to them, here is the path to life. Here is how you live out of that freedom. Uh, if you want the richest life possible, here is how that looks. And in a kind of marriage ceremony, they said, I do. 
and they took on the sign of that covenant. And then here in chapter 32, while they're on their honeymoon, they spotted someone else and slept with them. And God's response is not, yeah, that's all cool, we'll figure it out. God's response was, hey Moses, just park yourself over here out the way a moment because I still want to make you into a great nation, but this lot I'm done with. This is the wrath of God, and I do not like this as a message to preach. There are much nicer sermons for a preacher to give, but but God hates sin. God is not indifferent to our rebellion against him. He hates it. And he hates it because sin and rebellion, it, it corrupts and it distorts and destroys the life that God wants for his people. And so God, in his goodness, his wrath burns against sin. And if it didn't, God would not be good. His wrath burns against the things that rot our souls and our communities and our relationships and leaves this trail of decay and death in its wake. And you only have to flick on the news for a moment to see that that's the way the world is going. Now, ultimately, God will kill and put an end to all that rebellion. He'll do that once and for all through the cross. But first, let me offer this picture. Uh, There's this um, disease uh, in trees, this fungal infection that kills trees. And rather appropriately for us, it is called heart rot. Heart rot. And this fungus, it gets inside the bark of a tree, and there are no visible symptoms on the outside. But what it does is it gets into the core of the tree, into the trunk, and it just begins to rot from the inside out. And in the end, it's these huge hardwood trees that are affected. These huge, massive trees, they still look solid as anything on the outside, but in reality, a grown person could lean on it and push it to the ground. Here's a picture of what that looks like. And we are just like this. We present this image to the people around us that we've got it all together, that we're good people. And we'll blame and we'll justify as much as we can to keep that image going. But in reality, our projection of strength is masking heart rot. I'm sure we've seen this happen, haven't we? Where where suddenly the tree comes crashing down. And we look on a situation and think, wow, what, what happened to that marriage? What happened to that person that they so went off the rails? I didn't see that coming. An outward projection of strength when all the time we're inwardly rotting. This is what it's like. This is a picture for us of what it looks like to live in rebellion against God and to sit under his wrath. Now, God's wrath isn't what we tend to picture. It's not the kind of lightning bolts from heaven or tsunamis or whatever else. When it's described in Romans chapter 1, God's wrath is put simply like this. It's turning us over to chase the things we want to chase. It's like God says to us, look, you think this thing or that thing or this person would make a great God? Well, you go chase after that and we'll see where we end up. And we end up being hollowed out and eventually collapsing. It's heavy stuff. Let's just take a moment to to breathe because we're not done yet. It'd be a dreadful sermon if this is the point where I stopped. We've seen God's kindness. We've seen our rebellion against it. We've seen that that puts us on the wrong end of God's wrath. But finally, we get to atonement. Look with me at verse 30. What we see here is absolutely stunning. That that even as God's wrath is burning against us, God still moves towards his people. And Moses tries to go and make atonement. Verse 30, the next day Moses said to the people, you have committed a great sin, but now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Now this is something, of course, that Moses can't do. He can't pay for the sins of Israel. But he goes and he pleads for God to hold back his anger and forgive their sin. 
and God relents. God relents, I, I think in part because Moses is a picture of someone who is to come. Moses can't atone for God's people because he himself is a sinful person. But Moses going up that mountain to make a way for the people to be made right with God is a picture for us of Jesus, who would later climb the Mount of Crucifixion. Jesus, the one who would make atonement for all our sins, for all our rebellion, past, present, and future. And so even, even in, in this situation, they find themselves like this tree. Even then, there is hope. Sometimes, you know, I think we avoid a deeper relationship with God because we're walking in shame. Often it's shame that's attached to those moments where we know that we've, that we've done stuff wrong. Maybe we've tried to, to blame others for it. Maybe we've tried to justify ourselves. But we know, we know deep down that, that we've done wrong, that we've rebelled against God, and we are ashamed of that. If you have any sense of that feeling this morning, then hear this. When Jesus took those nails on the cross, when Jesus hung there dying in your place and in mine, he took all that. He took all that shame. He took all the consequences of your rebellion and mine onto himself. And he made atonement for them. And so now what that means is that according to the Bible, you and I, if we have chosen to put our trust in Jesus, to trust our lives into his hands, according to the Bible, we now stand before God spotless, blameless in his sight. And that's the invitation for us this morning. That's what's on the table again for us this morning. And we know that it's true because of resurrection, that Jesus, you know, that Jesus rose from the dead, the clearest possible demonstration of Jesus' victory over sin and rebellion and death. So this is the story that's over all our lives. That God moves towards us in his kindness and mercy. We, we so often and readily rebel against that and we, we stir up God's wrath against us. But the good news, the best possible news, is that Jesus atones for our sin, that that relationship, that life with God might be restored. And so as we respond to that word this morning, I think there are, there are a few different things that that might look like for us, and I want to give us just space to have our own conversation with God as we sing together in a moment. For those of us who are, who are Christians, re real Christians, those who are not perfect but genuinely pursuing the life of Jesus, we have so much to celebrate, so much to give thanks to God for. And so in a moment, you might just want to, again, pour out your praise and thanksgiving that Jesus took your shame, took all of the stuff that, uh, that, that comes as a consequence of your rebellion against God. There may be others of you who are still undecided, still exploring these questions, still figuring out what does this mean for me? And you might just want to have a conversation in the quiet with God in a moment about where, where you stand in relation to God's mercy and kindness, in relation to his wrath, in relation to Jesus' offer on the table for you this morning that says, I can take all your shame. I can deal with that if you let me. But there's a third category who we might kind of call the religiously lost. We're kind of religious, but we're lost at the same time. You know, we, we kind of know enough to claim something of the name of Jesus, but there's very little evidence of our lives really pursuing Jesus, not just as the one who saves, but also as Lord of our lives. We know enough to kind of consider ourselves a Christian, but, but there's little sign of really pursuing the things of Jesus and his kingdom. It's a bit like, you know, we, we've taken a label 
on the outside that says Jesus and we've stuck it over the, the bark of the tree when really what's needed is, is to invite Jesus into our hearts by his spirit to do that work in us that only he can do of making us new and complete and whole. And so if that's you, I'd encourage you to have that conversation with God as we pray and as we sing. If you're comfortable able to stand, should we, should we stand together? God, this is a hard word this morning. And yet we see that there is such hope for us, that life is on offer to us through Jesus sacrifice on the cross however we come before you this morning whether we're near or far whether we're celebrating or broken that this offer is on the table that we can choose to step back into relationship with you to receive all that you have done for us on the cross I just sense that there's, there is that real conversation for some of us to have that actually we've been trying to do a bit of both and straddling both worlds just doesn't work because we won't be able to enjoy the things of the world fully because we know that Jesus is tugging at our heart. But we also won't be able to live fully in the life of God either. And in a sense, we have a choice before us to receive the life of God or to go it our own way. So, Lord, we just choose to, to talk that through with you now. So I encourage you to continue praying through those things. If the words of this song are helpful for you, feel free to, to use them too.
God take us back the place we began the simple pursuit of nothing but you really aware that some of you are just continuing to do business with God and I don't want to interrupt that conversation so please that is more important than what we're about to do um, for you in this moment so so please continue to do that I'm also aware that this this morning was was one where really it felt appropriate to have invited people forward for prayer ministry and we're just not quite set up for that yet but if you would value somebody praying with you before you go this morning please don't leave this place until you've asked somebody to do that. You can ask me, you can ask, uh, you know, ask the people around you um, to pray for you before you head off. Just as we stand, we have an opportunity to uh, declare our faith in God together. Let's say these words together. We believe in one God, the creator of all things in heaven and on earth. We believe in one Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins and rose again from the dead for our justification. We believe in one Holy Spirit. In him we are baptised into the body of Christ, the Church. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Do be seated for a moment. We're going to um, draw our time together by um, by by praying. We're going to pray for our community. We're going to pray for a few different things. And again, we're going to do that through uh, song this morning. Um, but first, it's a, a pleasure of mine to uh, publish some bands of marriage. Um, so I publish the bands of marriage between James Andrew Davison and Kimberly Ann Ross, uh, both of this parish. This is the first time of asking. If any of you know any reason in law why they may not marry each other, you are to declare it. So uh, as, we, as we pray together, the, the first thing I want us to pray for is to, to pray for James and Kim. They're getting married in September, just a few weeks away now. Um, sadly, um, they're not able to be with us this morning, but they should be around uh, next week. And uh, to, to pray for them, but to pray for, pray for marriages and relationships in general, that God would strengthen and bless. Um, those are, I'm aware of, of so many people who, who've had a tough time during lockdown, whose um, weddings have been postponed or had to look really different. Um, and so we want to pray for those people. We're also going to pray for those um, who perhaps long for relationship, long to be married and, and, and aren't. So we're also going to pray for those people too. Um, but I, I'm going to suggest that we do that. We've, we did this a few times on the car park when we were uh, worshipping outside through the summer last year and just kind of singing uh, God's blessing over, over people and over situations. And so we're going to um, do that again uh, this morning. Um, if you want to stand, then um, feel free to do that. If you'd rather pray seated or kneeling, then do that as well. Um, but we're going to yeah, just pray for, these, uh, for, for some, yeah, some different situations. So Father, first of all, we pray for for James and for Kim. We thank you for your hand on their lives and for their upcoming wedding. And we just pray your blessing on them and all the other couples who will be getting married or just recently married. Lord, that you would draw them closer to one another and to you. We pray for all those who've just found um, relationships difficult during uh, the lockdowns. I'm just aware of the strain that that has put on some relationships. And God, we, 
We long for you to pour out your blessing wherever there has been struggle as well. So as we just perhaps call to mind some people, some situations known to us, we sing these words over those people, over their homes and their situations. Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord turn his face toward you and give you So we call to mind those known to us who are sick or struggling in some way. Those who are in need of healing, whether it's physical, emotional, mental. God, we know that you're a God who heals. And so we pray your blessing on each person known to us who is struggling this morning. The Lord bless you. shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. I want us to pray last of all for our, this community that we're in, the people and the homes on our doorstep the businesses around us. Those will be in the park later on today. Our friends and neighbours, the people we see at the bus stop or down the shops. Let's pray for something of God's blessing to break into people's lives and in their homes. One of the things we did that was quite powerful when we uh, were outside was to just turn and face all around the different uh, parts of the parish and just extend a hand towards them. So if you want to do that, might be easier for us to stand if that's uh, if that's the posture we're going to take but just as we pray for our community i wonder whether that might be an appropriate thing for us to do god we just ask your blessing on this community on east park and Eastfield in particular or we pray for breakthrough where people are stuck where people are lost that you would find them lord would you pour out your blessing on our streets and on our homes we pray Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you be gracious to you Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace
confess you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So drawing our prayers together, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Do uh, grab your seats a moment. We just want to tell you about some things that are going on uh, here at St. Matthew's um, before we, uh, we head off into the rest of our day. Uh, I said at the start, New Wine so far has been such a blessing, so much amazing teaching, times of worship, opportunities to gather together. And the good news is that we're, we're only just halfway through. Um, so we're continuing to gather in the, uh, in the Vicarage Garden um, for the, the remaining sessions. So it runs through till Tuesday night. So you can join us in the evenings at seven o'clock um, for, the, for the evening worship and teaching. You can join us in the mornings from nine o'clock onwards for the, uh, the kids' session and then the, the adults at 11 o'clock. And we've got seminars and things going on in the afternoons as well. We would love you to join us. Uh, we really would. One of the, the hugest blessings of it is actually being able to gather together to watch. You can find the sessions at home and on YouTube. Uh, by all means, do that if you can't be with us. But don't miss out on the fellowship and the opportunity to share together as community and to talk with one another about what God is saying to us. There was one word given on the first night, actually, about um, a book with um, uh, kind of loads of messy writing uh, all over the pages, and it was all getting a bit muddled. But this sense that actually what God is doing is he's turned over a new page, and there's this new beautiful writing being written into a new chapter of the story. And there was a sense that that was a word for the UK church, but, but actually for us here at St. Matthew's, that very much feels like that is the case, that we, we're starting this new chapter together and that God is writing something beautiful and we want to gather and pray and celebrate what God is beginning to do here. So do come and join us for that at the Vicarage Garden. The um, family, uh, family fun events that we've got going on um, are... I'm, I'm going to be really good, Debs. I'm going to say what Debs told me to, which is that they're fully booked. If you still want to come and join a waiting list, you can still tell us that, um, but they are fully booked uh, as things stand. Um, so, um, yeah, we're, we're going to have loads of fun with those, and as they're so popular, we will do more things like that, no doubt, in the future as well. Um, something I wanted to mention, um, two quick things about, um, about Sunday stuff. I'm really keen to get um, more uh, musicians uh, involved in terms of leading worship, especially as we, when the weather fades, we'll be inside more of the time. Um, and so I'm, I'm putting out some dates um, for anyone who would like to be part of the worship ministry here to come along and to, to sing and play uh, and see how you might be involved in that. It's been a, a good long while now since we've had uh, the full band together. So if, if, whether you were part of it before or not, if music is something you're passionate about and you just love to worship in song, do come and join us for those dates. Ask me when they are. We'd love to include you uh, and get together and, and worship together. And then the second thing around Sundays is to mention communion. So as you know, we've been having communion every single week as part of the nine o'clock service. Um, we've, we've only had communion the once in this 10.30 service so far. And so just to let you know, during August, there will be communion in this 10.30 service on the 15th and the 22nd of August. So two weeks time and the week after that as well. Um, those two services will be communion and then we're looking from September to maybe have more of a regular pattern so it's a bit more predictable um, but we will continue the nine o'clock communion service as well. I think that's everything I needed to uh, share with you this morning so I'm going to pray God's blessing on us as we go. 
The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.